Hello, my name is John Neal and I'm here to talk to you briefly about a thinking model called FACTUP. Let me just give you a little bit of background of who I am and how I came to do this. I originally trained as an exercise physiologist and spent about 12 years of my life trying to get people fitter and healthier. But no matter how many programs we gave them, we didn't really get change. So I decided to requalify as a psychologist and try and work out how we could get into their heads. I now work as a psychophysiologist looking at the brain and the body as one. And that's really the approach we're going to take in this short fact up decision making presentation. Um, who do I work for? I work at a business school called Ashridge Business School. I also work a great deal for the uh, military and in international sport. And I'm lucky enough to have used and developed this model through international sport. I'm also um, working currently at the uh, Royal Household at Buckingham Palace. So let's get into this fact up model and talk a little bit about how the brain works. Now I apologise if you are uh, well educated in this area of psychophysiology and particularly the structure of the brain. But what I'm going to try and do is make it very simple, very straightforward, so you can use it uh, in a practical way in the way that you work. So I'm just going to talk about three elements of the brain. First element I'd like to talk about is uh, what we'll call brain one. Brain one is the ancient part of the brain and really responsible for the fight or flight response. That's the secretion of adrenaline and the idea that as soon as we perceive something to be a threat you know, from caveman days, we're either going to fight with it, fight with it, or freeze and stay very still. Uh, this part of our brain changes our physiology, it makes our heart beat faster, it makes our blood uh, more likely to congeal, uh, our blood pressure goes up. Lots of physiological changes ready for that fighting animalistic response to an external threat. So that's brain one. Brain two is the very interesting part of our brain that is created through our experiences in life as we grow up and get older. Now, the key element here is the adrenaline. So if we have an experience which is adrenalized, it creates a pathway at level two in our brain. Let me explain what I mean. If I was to uh, eat with you and I ate in this manner, I imagine, like me, you would be a little bit upset. But when I asked you to explain why you found that particular way of eating upsetting, we'd always find it quite hard to explain. And of course, the reason is, well, we were taught not to do that, but why? And the why is always difficult. The reason is because it's an experience we had when we were younger that determines how we perceive and see the world, and eating in that way is inappropriate. Let me explain. When I was younger, my father told me many, many times to eat with my mouth closed. But you know how dads always talk to their kids, but we never listen. I didn't listen. And on one occasion, I was eating my meal with my dad on my right, my mum in front of me, and my brother to my left. And once again, I was eating with my mouth open. In fact, a little bit worse than that, I was showing my brother how good I was at eating my food. I'm sure you've done the same. My dad had told me many times not to eat in that way. But on this occasion, he gave me the look. Now, if your dad had a look, you knew that when you got that look, that stare, that was the precursor to him taking action. Unless, of course, I reacted to the look. And on this occasion, I was too concerned with my brother to react or even see the look. My mother tried to warn me. My brother was less helpful. He told me to continue because he knew what was coming next. And sure enough, it did. My dad kicked the chair from underneath me. I landed on all fours on the kitchen floor. And he said, young man, if you're not going to listen to my words, then you'll have to learn in a different way. And if you want to eat like an animal and behave like an animal, you can finish your meal like an animal. With that, he took the plate off the table, put it on the floor in front of me and told me to eat off the floor with my hands behind my back. Now, you may think that's child abuse, but actually when you're little, it's really quite funny. And there we have an example of an adrenalized event which created a pathway in my head that said, that's not the right way to eat. So that level two part of your brain can be formed any time in life. It's just that the adrenaline has to be greater the older that we get. So when we're young, it only needs a tiny bit of adrenaline for us to say, this is how the world is. But as we get older, the adrenaline has to become greater. The event has to become more emotionally engaging for us to change our perceptions. So that is 
level two. And it's the classic thing about perception when we're looking at a cup of water, is it half empty, is it half full, will depend entirely upon our perceptions and our previous experiences. So that's brain two. Let's have a look now at the third part of the brain I want to identify for you. Um, and it's the upper cortex. It's the thinking part of our brain. It's the bit that makes us different from the animals. See, if you give an animal food, level one of its brain says, eat food, eat food, eat food. And it will continue to eat until eventually it's sick. Some of those animals then eat their own sick. Now, brain three makes us different. Because what brain three will do is enable us to make choices based upon the left and the right hemisphere. And in very basic terms, and it isn't as simple as this, but in basic terms, left side of the brain, logic, learning, the past, right side of the brain, imagination, creativity, future. Let me give you an example of how we make decisions. Imagine walking up to the buffet in a hotel and you've had a very nice lunch or dinner and there laid out are the puddings. And you look at the puddings and you pause. Because at that point your left brain kicks in and it says logically, if you eat more food than you burn up in a day, you put on weight. This food is calorifically dense, I haven't taken much exercise. On a logical perspective, I should say no. But then the right side of the brain kicks in and says, can you imagine the taste of that food? Imagine the hit of sugar that you get, that lovely feeling, and you know what? It won't make much difference. Oh, go for it, go for it. And we have the left and the right brain balancing. That upper cortex, level three, is connected by the corpus callosum. And this is what makes us different because we stand in front of that buffet and slowly we make a decision to either eat it or not eat it. And the key there is the speed at which that part of our brain works. Level three works relatively slowly compared to level one and two. Those parts, one and two, work 80,000 times faster than level three. And the reason is clear. Because when we are confronted by a lion, tiger or bear, we don't really want our upper cortex working. It works too slowly. It will come up with a strategy of how to deal with lions, tigers and bears. It will assess their term of velocity if they were to run at us and very interesting things. They would even come up with a strategy, throw them the weakest member of our group. But ultimately, that would be too slow. So when we perceive a threat, immediately level one of our brain kicks in. Level two perceives what is going on and level three makes decision. But this is what happens under pressure. If, as a result of our evolution, and frankly, we haven't evolved quickly enough for the world which we now inhabit, but if we have a threat, a lion, tiger, or bear, we get the fight, fight, or freeze, freeze response. That is created initially by the perception of level two. So if level two says this is a threat, it will immediately activate an adrenal response at level one and will get the fight, fright or freeze response. Then, this is important, level three will be shut down. There is no need for upper cognition when we perceive we're under threat. So if you've been involved in an accident, you'll know exactly what I mean. In an accident, often we'll lose our peripheral vision. We'll lose a sense of hearing, emotion, touch and feel and smell we'll have an, a very, very good memory visually, but only in our line of sight, in slow motion, and typically in black and white. Because at this point, level two has perceived this to be a threat to our life. Level one has been adrenalized, we change our physiology, we, we battle to stay alive, and lane th uh, level three shuts down. We don't need level three. And this is really important because whilst most of us do not deal with lions, tigers and bears. Most of us deal with meetings, deadlines and people that annoy us, but the brain can't tell the difference. So if we've got a meeting or a deadline or somebody that annoys us and our level two perceives that to be a threat, we will initiate level one response, fight with them, run away from them, freeze. Inappropriate responses in our modern world, but the brain can't tell the difference. So let me introduce you to a really fairly straightforward model. It's called the performance curve. Now along the bottom of this model is perceived pressure. Level two, based upon our experiences, how we all perceive the world. It's different for different people, although it might be the similar event. So along the bottom, P 
perceived pressure up the side individual performance. Now, if the perceived pressure is very low, people will be bored. There's nothing to do. We need excitement. Pressure's a good thing so long as we perceive we can cope. Now, the more we perceive we can cope, we'll become excited and the performance will start to rise. However, if we perceive that the pressure is too great in our ability to cope, we then perceive that as a threat. Now, if we're constantly adrenalized, constantly being activated by level one, then we'll start eventually to burn out. So those are the two ends of this performance curve. On the left-hand side, as we move up the curve, if we perceive something to be a challenge, we are excited. At that point, level three works reasonably well, and we think really clearly, and that's great, and we're excited, and we're in flow. But as soon as it becomes threat, we get cognitive shutdown and physiological tiredness, and that's where we've got a problem. Of course, as performance coaches, what we try and do is get ourselves into that peak level at the top of the curve. Now, in this point, what we really need to be doing is activating level three and C-tupping, correctly thinking under pressure. The work of a gentleman uh, in Israel called Yehudi Shinar. And I would suggest this ability to correctly think under pressure is what makes the difference between success and failure at the top level. Because at the top level, everyone's clever, Everyone's done courses, they've got experiences. What really makes the difference is not fitness and all those elements that, particularly in elite performance, matter. What really counts is your ability to make the right decisions under pressure, to access your level three. So, what we're going to talk about is how do we correctly think under pressure? And this is really where we have a challenge because at a world-class level, what makes the difference is this correct thinking. And the challenge is, are you a world-class thinker under pressure? So how do you do it? Let me introduce you to uh, the FACT-UP model. So the first element of the FACT-UP model is to simply add an A. This stands for ACT UP. Act differently. Let's go back to our performance model. We know that in order to develop thinking within the brain, to learn, we don't do it just with books. We need experiences. So what I'd suggest is if you want to act differently under pressure, you need to identify some challenges that will take you further up the left-hand side of that curve. They'll take you so far into challenge, but never into threat. We know when you go into threat, cognitive shutdown. But if we can go into challenge, we work at level three. We can repattern the brain. Let me give an example. Somebody who particularly is nervous about public speaking, one of the things would be to perhaps go on a stand-up comedy course. Now, some of the people may perceive that to be the ultimate threat, the worst thing you can do. However, if you can act up, if you can have a go at it, practice, 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 the more you take on that challenge, the less you perceive it to be a threat. As you do that, you start to learn, you start to be able to, under pressure, realize you can deal with it, you change your perceptions, and as a result of enacting that challenge and acting up, you don't go into threat, but you repattern the brain. So we avoid threat. So the act up is to take on challenges that will enable you to learn. So what is your learning challenge? What are the things that you want to be better at in thinking in your head? And what challenges would be exciting enough to enable you to learn to apply them under pressure? The second element of the fact up model is the F, the, the element which is absolutely critical. You see, most of us perceive the world and sometimes our perceptions are wrong. Those experiences we had when we were younger were wrong. I experienced this recently in China. Remember my experience of inappropriate eating with your mouth open. Well, in China, that is the normal way to do things. But I sat at the table. I couldn't bear to be sitting with my colleagues from China who would eat with their mouth open. And of course, they found it difficult sitting with me who would eat with my mouth closed. Now, the question is, I perceived it to be inappropriate. But in their culture, it wasn't. I had my facts wrong. And the key thing about facting up is to spend time identifying what are the facts in this situation. 
Now at this point I'm indebted to a colleague of mine called Nigel Redman who has come up with a little model that I think may help you in terms of understanding how we could fact up more effectively. So I want you to imagine a musical synthesizer with sliders on. Now in the old days you put a piece of music in this end and you could move the sliders up and down to get the best music out. Think about it in the same way. That let's imagine a situation and as a result of that situation you perceive something to be the case and as a result of that you have a number of thinking elements within your head, in this example trust, respect, security, care, right along the, uh, along the bottom. And as a result of those thinking elements you make a choice to behave in a certain way. But what happens if that situation changes? And your perceptions about that change. At that point, as a result of your perceptions, some of those thinking elements may drop off. And as a result of it, your choice about your behaviour may be affected. Well, here's where fact up works. Because what I'd like you to do is consider at that moment, after you've perceived it, ask yourself the question, is this the fact? Is this correct? Are my perceptions correct? And it's possible that they may not be. So at this point you seek more facts. As a result of seeking more facts, you may be less affected and be more accurate in the elements of your decision making, such as trust, honesty, respect, those drivers of behaviour. And a result of that, correctly think under pressure. It takes a moment to just stop that when you're in a pressured situation to ask yourself a key question, what are the facts here and what are the elements of my decision making that are absolutely critical to get the outcome or the music that I desire out of this thinking process. So here's the final challenge. How will you choose to behave under pressure to achieve the results not only you need but the organisation needs? In my situation sitting in China, I had to identify the facts. Say to myself, just because you perceive it to be wrong, the fact is they do not. So moderate your behaviour, smile, discuss, relate, and don't get upset by this whole eating thing. I hope that's been helpful. I hope you've got some ideas about how you could fact up, how you could think differently under pressure. The key element is brain one initiates the adrenaline. Brain 2 perceives whether adrenaline is needed and brain 3 is the part of the brain that we need. In order to activate brain 3, we need to act up, set challenges, change our perceptions and finally, fact up, seek the facts in a decision-making process. Thank you very much for your time.